Wow, fantastic, Matthew, fantastic. Look at all these friends. <laughs> all right, you're good to go. Grazie. <laughs> wow. Hi. All right. Adelaide, Adelaide. Hello, Adelaide. Hi. Gonzalo, fantastic. I recognize a lot of names. Ben yeah, that. no, this is really, really Hi. fantastic. All right. I think we're going to get started. Uh, so <laughs> good afternoon, everyone. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Hugo Bellin, the immediate past president of the Genetic Society of America. And I thank you for joining us for last year. Yeah, well, yeah. Okay. People could turn Hi, up. Minx. You could turn off. Hi, your good to see you. Nice to see you. So today, our speaker is uh, Minx Fuller, recipient of the 2022 Genetic Society of America Medal for outstanding contributions to genetics in the last 15 years. The award celebrates her pioneering work on cellular mechanisms that underlie Drosophila spermatogenesis which led to numerous discoveries pertaining to stem cell regulation, germline soma interactions, and germ cell differentiation. The award also recognizes her commitment to training and mentoring of graduate students and postdoctoral research, researchers. During the last 15 years, Minx has continued to make major contributions to the field by finding and then characterizing the function of spermatoc spermatocyte-specific genes that control gene expression and morphogenesis throughout spermatogenesis. Her early work on unpaired and the jack stat pathway focused attention on the signaling from the hub cells in maintaining stem cells. Subsequent work added insights into the active involvement of other pathways in the stem cell niche, and most recently in the role of endocytosis in somatic cyst cells. Her work defining the function of testes specific transcription factors, translational control, and mitochondrial morphogenesis are examples of her wide ranging discoveries that characterize her leadership in the field. Ming's legacy as a scientist extends beyond her groundbreaking contributions to the field. She is a role model and inspiration for her trainees and students, many of whom are running their own laboratories in the field of Drosophila genetics. Her passion for science is evident in her approach to teaching. She's kind and generous, and a kind and generous mentor who excels in giving credit and in giving away projects to her trainees. Ming's life, lifelong emphasis on doing good science and building a scientific community set her apart as a true leader in the field. And we are very excited that she's here today and will share her work with us. Before we continue, I have two quick housekeeping items that I want to mention. The first is that all GSA online events are covered by our code of conduct. You can find that on the link in the chat box. The second is to remind you about questions and answer sessions. At the end of the talk, I will let Minx decide if she wants to answer questions and which ones. Uh, and so she'll be in charge of uh, reading the chat box. If needed, I'll help her. And with this, welcome Minx. Please take it away. Thank you, thank you so much. And uh, thank you Hugo for the very kind introduction. Thank you all the people who are logged on to this audience. Uh, many of you are, have contributed to the work I'm gonna talk about and are uh, honored with this award. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay, does it look fine? It looks great. All right, terrific. I, um, I want to thank, let me just uh, fix the laser pointer here. I want to start by thanking the GSA so much for this award. It's, it's just been so meaningful to me, uh, uh, this recognition by the community. Uh, today, I'm going to tell you about uh, basically my life in science here 
uh, studying self-renewal, proliferation, and differentiation in adult stem cell lineages. But before I start with that, I want to talk a little bit about how I became a geneticist. I started out as a, first as a cell biologist and then as a protein biochemist. In my graduate work with Jonathan King at MIT, I purified proteins, columns in the cold room and studied virus capsid assembly. Um, however, I was in the microbiology pro PhD program at MIT and uh, teachers like David Botstein and Ethan Signer uh, stressed and drilled into us what uh, David calls APOG, the awesome power of genetics, uh, where uh, uh, as David would say, genetics are the shock troops you send in when you don't know how something works because it can give you a list of the genes that have important functions for the process you're interested in. And I wanted to start with this slide because I wanted to explicitly acknowledge many mentors and trainers that shaped my scientific journey. I mentioned Jonathan King, who had a foundational effect as my thesis advisor. I went on to, uh, when I uh, finished my uh, PhD, I decided I wanted to study the cytoskeleton and taking to heart APOG that had been drilled into us, I decided that uh, what the cytoskeletal field needed at the time was genetics. There wasn't really much genetic analysis at the time. So I went to Indiana University to work with Elizabeth Raff and Thomas Kaufman, my two postdoctoral mentors, who were working on uh, mutations in tubulin. Uh, Elizabeth Raff uh, really taught me a lot about cell, bi cell biology, cytoskeleton and development. Thomas Kaufman taught me a lot about genetics, initial, especially the lesson when you wanna understand what a gene does, you wanna look at the very first phenotypic effects, not some downstream thing that happens way later and can have uh, be very messy, but what goes wrong first? I also wanna acknowledge Tony Mahawalt. Uh, when we were postdocs in Indiana, Tony, who was a professor there, held night school classes for all the postdocs going over classic Drosophila development. Um, then after my postdoc, I was lucky enough to be recruited by Bill Wood, another mentor who taught me a lot about developmental biology and also about teaching. Uh, my first appointment was in MCDB biology in Boulder, Colorado, where people like Dick McIntosh, played a key role, uh, allowing me to use all the reagents in his lab when I was first setting up his lab, have joint group meetings, and he taught me a lot about cell biology. Then um, next mentors were Lucy Shapiro, especially, and David Hogness, who recruited me to Stanford to be one of the early members of the Department of Developmental Biology. And David Bostein also recruited me uh, to join the genetics department at Stanford. And I've been at Stanford uh, and most of the work I'm gonna talk about, almost all of it was carried out at Stanford. We're immersed in a developmental biology department. My original interest in cell biology and cytoskeleton morphed into how cell fate decisions are made and how cells are change shape as they go through the differentiation process. So, First, I'm acknowledging the mentors and the people who train me, but most important, I want to call out the acknowledgement to the people who have worked in my lab. So here's the first, I have two slides here. The first it shows some uh, alumni from earlier days. Many of these, you know, all these people worked in my lab and many of them now are running their own labs and in academia or are leaders in biotech or are uh, leading teachers. And uh, now other people in the lab as well, down to at the bottom row, some of the current lab members. You guys are tremendous. And it is due to the creative ideas and the hard work and the rigor and enthusiasm of all you people who've worked with me over the years that I owe this award. And I really feel like my most important contribution to science is all of you trainees out there 
doing great science in whatever context. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so the next thing I wanted to say is I'm a geneticist. Why do I love genetics? It's because, as I say, phenotype trumps all. In other words, when you have a mutant that has a phenotype, you know that that gene plays an important functional role in vivo. So you're starting out by knowing you're looking at something functionally important. The corollary of that phenotype trumps all is that the more phenotype you can score, the more likely you will be able to identify the set of genes that are involved in the precise process you're interested in. And I'll come back to that. The other reason I like genetics, I love genetics, is because I like surprises. So when you are taking a forward genetics approach, you are not limited by your preconceived notions of how a particular process takes place. You are told by the mutant phenotype that such and such a gene is important, and you might end up in a completely different part of molecular biology mechanism than you thought. And uh, you'll see as I go through the presentation of some of the work we've been doing over the past several years, that has led my lab following our nose to the phenotypes has led my lab to be working on a large number of molecular processes that collaborate to let cells differentiate. So um, the general, the question that I've dedicated my, uh, my scientific career to is really at the interface of genetics and cell and developmental biology. And I like to say, what I'm most fascinated by is how does the developmental program regulate fundamental cellular processes to produce specialized cell types? So for example, of course, specialized transcription, uh, specialized cell cycles, specialized cell shape affecting the cytoskeleton, specialized shape and positioning of subcellular organelles. How does the developmental program do that? How does it impose an extra layer of regulation? And the, the kind of uh, biological context in which I have been studying those questions is in the regulation of self-renewal, proliferation, and differentiation in adult stem cell lineages. Now, why are those important? So many of the cell types in your body are produced and maintained from adult stem cell lineages. Across the top here, I have three examples of highly active stem cell lineages, the stem cell lineage for the red blood cells, stem cell lineage for your skin, stem cell lineage for your intestinal epithelium. Uh, red blood cells have a, a lifespan of about of a few months and surface skin cells a few weeks and intestinal epithelia a few days. So you have to keep producing these very specialized cell types throughout your life. And the cell types are so specialized that they can't divide to reproduce themselves. A red blood cell and a surface fully differentiated uh, skin cell, they don't even have a nucleus in humans. So they must be continuously produced and differentiated from less differentiated dedicated precursors. And those are the adult stem cells or tissue stem cells and they're dedicated to their particular cell type. Hematopoietic stem cells don't make skin and intestinal cells don't make uh, blood, for example. But in addition to these familiar, really high throughput adult stem cell lineages, um, there are also many tissues in the body that have uh, more quiescent adult stem cell lineages where the stem cells are often not dividing but they're in reserve to reproduce to produce uh, differentiated cells in uh, according to the demands, demands of physiology, for example, for the mammary gland or in for repair, for example, in muscle injury or lung injury, bladder infection, etc. So the ability, the understanding of how you get differentiated cell types proliferation then differentiation in all these lineages is really critical for maintaining your tissues, 
for preventing tissue dysmorphosis, scarring, et cetera. And also I think for preventing cancer. So in, in all these adult stem cell lineages, this is, these are the basic events that take place. There are the stem cells that are set aside usually in a special microenvironment called the niche. And then when those cells divide, you have to both re self renew the stem cell population and produce daughter cells that are gonna start differentiation. And how this is balanced is really important so you can maintain the stem cell activity through your life. Then not all, but in most adult stem cell lineages, there's a period of transit amplifying mitotic divisions so that you get a large number of precursors out of one adult stem cell division. And then those cells have to stop dividing and turn on the correct terminal differentiation program to make the specialized cell type that that lineage is dedicated to. So each of these points are important points of regulation. And I posit that, I mean, it didn't escape your notice that all these adult stem cell tissues maintained by adult stem cell types are uh, cell tissues in which common forms of human cancer arise, for example. So what if some origins of cancer are when these critical processes of self-renewal versus differentiation counting how many divisions to make before uh, differentiating and then turning off proliferation and turning on the correct gene expression proteins uh, programs for the final cell type. If those go awry, if those aren't done correctly, could that give rise to cancer? Okay, so I've chosen over the years to study these questions in a model adult stem cell lineage, which is spermatogenesis. Males make lots and lots of sperm continuously throughout their reproductive life from adult stem cells, male germline stem cells. This is a cartoon of spermatogenesis in Drosophila, which I focused on because of all the powerful tools of Drosophila genetics. You have adult stem cells at the tip of the testis. They produce a daughter that's going to go through a series, a limited series of mitotic transit amplifying divisions with incomplete cytokinesis. So these divisions take place in synchrony to produce a cluster of cells that goes through after the last mitosis, they go through a final, the final S phase they'll ever do in their life. And then all 16 of these cells together start the differentiation process into spermatocytes. They grow 25 times in volume. And then after about three and a half days in meiotic prophase, they go through the final two divisions of meiosis one and two. And then the germ cells 64 now spend the next five days remodeling every part of the cell. So this is the differentiation process I dedicated my scientific career to understanding. So here's a diagram of what's happening in the testis. Thank you, Sarah Stern, current graduate student for this drawing. So the stem cells reside at the apical tip of the testis. The germline stem cells are in blue. This a green thing is called the hub. It's very important, I'll tell you in a minute. Uh, the yellow are somatic stem cells that are partners for the germline stem cells. And when the germline stem cells produce the daughter cells that are gonna go through their transit amplifying divisions, the somatic stem cells produce daughters that don't divide again, but two somatic cells enclose each cyst of germ cells throughout the entire differentiation process. So you have the somatic cells containing the cyst of uh, proliferating and differentiating germ cells, like in a tiny little mini organ. Most of our organs, as you know, are made of epithelial layers surrounding mesenchyme. Well, here you have a little two cell epithelial layer surrounding a group of differentiating cells and the germline and the somatic cells co-differentiate with each other. How is this coordinated? Then eventually the uh, germ cells elongate into elongated sperm. So what's really cool for a geneticist and what convinced me to start working on this process is that this is the actual Drosophila testis. So the stem cells are here at the tip. These are growing spermatocytes. Here are um, haploid uh, early round spermatids. This is a cyst in the first meiotic division. And here are the elongating spermatid bundles stretching up the testis. So in an unfixed preparation, either whole like this or open and squashed gently, you can see in the microscope in something that takes five minutes to prepare, 
so many aspects of the cell differentiation process. And this makes this a geneticist dream because you can look for mutants that affect specific different processes. Remember I said, the ability to score lots of phenotype is the key to identify using a genetic approach to identifying genes that are important for specific processes. This is what got me going on using spermatogenesis as a genetic tool to look at cell differentiation. So I wanna tell you three brief stories about some of the work we've been doing over the years in my lab. The first is a short story about regulation of self-renewal versus uh, producing the cell that's gonna start differentiation at the stem cell, the stem cells at the apical tip. Then I'm gonna tell you a story about how spermatocytes turn on a very cell type specific transcription program. And then I'm gonna tell you about some very recent work where uh, we're finding that regulation of changes in cell state from proliferating precursors to uh, differentiating spermatocytes involves tremendous changes on, on nascent transcripts that uh, affect uh, the kinds of proteins that are produced in the two cell types. So this is a uh, Im immunostain picture of the tip of a Drosophila testis. And in red here, are the germline stem cells surrounding this empty area here are the somatic cells of the hub. So this was fantastic. So when I was in a, a starting assistant professor in Boulder, Colorado, I, had, I was assigned to teach developmental biology. I'd never had a developmental biology course in my life. And since I was the new professor, I was assigned to teach the things nobody else wanted. I had to teach bone and blood and things like that. Well, the main thing in blood, of course, is hematopoietic stem cells. And the field had the model that there might be a local microenvironment that governs stem cell self-renewal, but they couldn't identify the microenvironment because the first thing you do in classic hematopoietic uh, stem cell research is you take the cells out and you fact sort them and you transplant them. So you can't study the role of the microenvironment. So I decided, look, that's a great question. And here in the Drosophila testis, we have a wonderful system to get at how the microenvironment influences stem cell behavior because we know where the stem cells are, we know what cells they sit next to, and we can genetically manipulate different cell types. So that led to my lab, uh, the, the adventure on looking at stem cells. This is a picture of stem cells expressing GFP in the germline. Here are the stem cells. This is taken by Yukuko Yamashita when she was a postdoc in the lab. The asterisk is the hub. Here are the male germline stem cells. This cell has just divided to make the gonioblast, the daughter that's gonna start differentiating. You can see they're still connected by a little cytoplasmic bridge. This uh, micrograph from Yukiko as well shows, so Yukiko when she was a postdoc showed that when this oriented division where the stem cell stays next to the hub and the daughter that's displaced away is going to initiate differentiation is set up by an oriented spindle. Here's the mitotic spindle. And it's oriented because one of the setosomes becomes pinned here at the interface of the hub, somatic cells of the hub, and the germ cells. And Yukiko uh, teamed up with Le uh, Leanne and they went on and showed that the hub cells have adherence junctions to the germ cells and that the tumor suppressor APC2, this is the colon cancer APC2, not the cell cycle one, is important for connecting up the um, centrosome in the germline stem cell to this adherence junction to the hub. And Yukiko devised a very clever way to label the daughter centrosome, the newly assembled one, set differently than the mother, and showed it's always the old centrosome, centrosomal Eve, that stays attached to this adherence junction. And the daughter centrosome migrates around to the opposite side of the nucleus in G2, and that's what sets up the oriented division. Now, Yukiko, of course, has gone on to found her own lab and uh, has followed this up beautifully. So there was a paper not from, from a different lab. Michael et al. showed that 
TGF beta receptor is activated only extremely locally, right where the germline stem cell attaches to the hub. And Inaba in Yukiko's lab showed that there are these, the germ cells send out these finger-like projections that stick into the hub cells. And that's where the signaling uh, is localized. So the hub sends very localized TGF beta class signals to activate TGF beta signal uh, reception in the germline stem cell. And this plays an important role in keeping germline stem cell identity. Meanwhile, the hub also sends a cytokine-like signal unpaired. And that uh, demonstrated beautifully in a paper by Leatherman and Donardo showed that that activation of JAK-STAT by unpaired from the hub maintains stem cell identity in the cyst stem cells. And then that stem cell identity maintenance in the cyst cells is important for the germ cells to maintain stem cell identity and not differentiate. So a number of people now have gone on to work on this interaction between the cyst cells and the germ cells in a number of labs. Uh, Jacqueline Lim in my lab showed that the cyst cells or the cyst stem cells are important for germ cells to be able to differentiate. If you kill them all, the germ cells keep proliferating like stem cells. Uh, uh, Cordless Schultz as a postdoc in my lab showed that the germ cells send an EGF class signal out to the somatic cells and that signal induces the somatic cells to send out processes to enclose the germ cells in this little two cell epithelium. Um, Erica Matunas, is a, when she was a grad student with um, uh, Steve DiNardo and then Hudson et al. and Cordela Schultz's own lab showed that reception of TGF beta signaling and high levels of EGF signaling by the somatic cells is important for the germ cells they enclose to become spermatocytes. Uh, uh, Cameron Berry in my lab showed that making septate junctions between the two cyst cells at the two cell at the four cell stage or the two cell stage is key for germ cells to survive past the four cell stage. And uh, Susanna Brantley showed that apical polarity complex, the PAR complex function is critical in the cyst cells. And if you don't have that proper orientation of the, uh, the apical a polarity complex in the cyst stem cells, they send a signal that kills the early spermatocytes that they enclose. So many people are working on this problem of how the germ cells and the somatic cells communicate in this small organ for co-differentiation. So now I wanna switch and tell you briefly about uh, uh, regulation of transcription in spermatocytes. So when the stem cells progeny stop dividing and turn on terminal differentiation, the final, how do they make the right cell type? So it turns out that, the, so this is a, a Drosophila testis with an in-situ hybridization to a gene called fuzzo. Uh, and this is expressed only in spermatocytes. So fuzzo, uh, it, it encodes the first known prote protein mediator of mitochondrial fusion and founded the field uh, uh, identification of mitofusins. It was uh, done by Karen Hales when she was a grad student in my lab. There are other genes that turn on this program specifically in spermatocytes, for example, RBP and 4 and FEST are translational repressor, repressors that keep cyclin B from turning on too early so that you can uh, have a, a long G2 of meiotic prophase. So there are, this is the most robust cell type specific gene expression program in the whole fly. The cells, the genes that turn on the spermatocytes. There's 800 to 1000 genes that turn on specifically in spermatocytes. So how is that program regulated? Well, we started uh, working on that because uh, when I was a postdoc, Beth Raff had in the lab a fly strain that had been collected in the fruit market in Rome by uh, Dan Lindsley that had this wonderful phenotype where all the germ cells differentiate to the mature spermatocytes, but then they arrest there and they don't go any further. So uh, a mutation that causes an arrest in a process triggered to me to think that maybe this uh, gene is involved, has some regulatory role uh, because the whole differentiation process stops. 
So over my early career, I collected mutations, other mutations and other genes that had the same meiotic arrest phenotype. And then over the years, we eventually positionally cloned a lot of the hard way before there was a genome project. Um, and it turned out that five of those genes encoded what we call testis TAFs. So TAFs are proteins that are part of the general transcription factor TF2D, which is involved in recruiting and positioning RNA polymerase to the, to the start of transcription. And yeast conserved from yeast demand, uh, the TF2D has a Tata binding protein that interacts with the DNA, and then about 14 associated proteins called TAFs that uh, called one through 14. And flies have homologs of those just like yeast and humans. But in addition, we found that flies have second homologs in the genome for five of those TAFs. And those second homologs are only expressed in primary spermatocytes. So there's a duty switch from the generally expressed TAF to these testis specific homologs. And that it turns out that those testis TAFs are important for turning on high level expression of about 800 of these genes that turn on only in spermatocytes. In addition, other meiotic arrest mutants were part of a protein complex, it turns out, called TMAX. So this was, the complex was eventually purified in Mike Botchen's lab in Berkeley, and he named it TMAC. But we had already identified many of the genetic components. So Helen White Cooper, when she was a postdoc in the lab, cloned always early, founding member of this class, part of this uh, protein complex. Uh, Lucia Perez Gazga in my lab and independently Helen in her lab cloned Topi and we did a joint paper and Helen identified many of these other components by yeast to hybrid genetic interaction, et cetera. So TMAC is a complex that is, has many spermatocyte only expressed homologs of generally expressed proteins that make up a well-known protein complex called Sinma B in C. elegans in humans and MIP dream in flies. Uh, and this is involved, it's a general regulator, usually a repressor, and then uh, a protein like MIB comes along and converts it into an activator for cell cycle control. So once again, spermatocyte specific homologs of a general complex are important for turning on the cell type specific gene expression program in spermatocytes. So if you're missing components, like if you're missing always early, about 800 of these genes are not transcribed at all. So that was really nice to take, have the message that you have a cell type specific program by turning on these cell type specific regulators, but we couldn't figure out how they worked. And the reason is that, um, very small numbers of cells, it's very hard to do the molecular biology. And one of the things about development of biology is usually the things you're most interested in are happening with only a small number of cells at a certain time. And so it's really hard to do molecular biology. So fortunately, the molecular field has moved on and people have developed more and more powerful, powerful techniques to look at small numbers of cells. And fortunately, Jungmin Kim, when he was a postdoc, uh, uh, sorry, a graduate student in my lab, developed a very clever way to get spermatogonia to differentiate into spermatocytes in synchrony. So mutants in, in a gene called bag of marbles, the spermatogonia keep proliferating for several extra rounds and then die. So if you have a fly that's mutant for bag of marbles, you have a testis filled with proliferating spermatocytes. But then if you have in the strain, a heat shock promoter driving expression of the missing protein, and you give those flies a 30 minute single pulse of heat shock, there's a pulse of BAM expression, you return the flies to normal temperature. And then over the ensuing days, the spermatogonia convert into spermatocytes and in synchrony go through differentiation. So for about the first day, the spermatogonia are doing their last mitosis and their final S phase. By 32 hours, you get the first expression of genes that are turned on in spermatocytes, et cetera, et cetera. And so by 72 hours, you have nice uh, maturing spermatocytes, intermediate spermatocytes. And those cells will go on and go through meiotic divisions and make functional sperm. 
So this let Zhang Min map out the temporal progression of gene expression programs. So first you get those cell cycle regulators turning on and TMAC and TTAF components, cell type specific turning on. And then they are responsible for activating about 800 genes like FUSO that turn on a little bit later for differentiation. Okay. So uh, the other thing that that did is let us have a test tube full of an organ full of spermatogonia with no spermatocytes, and then a different test tube with testis in it that have some proliferating spermatogony, but a lot of maturing spermatocytes at specific stages. So a very intrepid postdoc, Dan Liu, came to my lab and set out to do modern uh, state-of-the-art molecular biology using those samples. So uh, Will Greenleaf at the floor below us had invented tac a TACSEQ and Dan uh, took on the task of taking something that used to be done on cultured cells and being able to do it on tissues. And that maps what parts of the genome are accessible versus closed. And then she used CAGE, which is, identifies the precise nucleotide at which transcription starts so she could identify where the promoters were. And from that work, and as well as work with Chung Gang Lu and uh, Hosu Sin, we have come to the current uh, picture of how the spermatocyte specific promoters fire. So in spermatogonia, those promoters that are off in spermatogonia are closed. They're not accessible to a TACSEQ. Then in spermatocytes, Zhang Min uh, Kim showed by chromatin immunoprecipitation analysis that ALI, of ALI, that the TMAC complex binds to specific sites, uh, partly through this uh, DNA binding subunit Occubus that Helen White Cooper's lab had identified, and that action of ALI is required to open a small region, about on average 220 nucleotides in the DNA. Then uh, we think that mediator is recruited to that open chromatin and the testis tasks come in and the function of mediators required to turn on the, tar the target genes and the function of the testis tasks is required to elevate expression of those target genes by about tenfold. So this is how you get a cell type specific transcription program of about 800 genes being turned on. It's all at the promoter. And as a matter of fact, Chung Gang Lu showed that if you take very small regions around the promoter, they can drive cell type specific uh, transcription of GFP, for example. So it's not distal enhan enhancers in this case that are doing the cell type specificity, but promoter proximal elements being acted upon by cell specific uh, regulatory factors. Uh, so TMAC is this key, uh, complex that comes in and opens the promoters to allow gene expression. So Zhang Min uh, was exploring using his uh, technique, exploring what are the very earliest genes that turn on and what's their function. And he identified a protein called Kumgang, which is on the chromatin, in the nucleus and on the chromatin, it's a zinc finger protein. And he found that this very early gene that turns on is required to prevent TMAC from binding to and activating cryptic promoters all over the genome. So you have this very powerful mechanism for turning on cell type specific transcription. But before you turn it on, you, the cells turn on a protein complex, including a gene called DANI, which Noza Matias, a current postdoc in the lab is working on, that blocks the ability of TMAC to activate open and activate the wrong sites. So uh, one of the conundrums that uh, Noza is working on is uh, Danny and Kumgang and Maitu are in a protein complex and they're binding along the active genes, probably perhaps binding the RNA or writing with the polymerase, but their action is required to prevent TMAC from, act, from opening chromatin and allowing activation of cryptic promoters in other places in the genome. How, do, how does that work? We don't know. Stay tuned for Noza's uh, analysis. So kind of the take home here is when you 
turn on a terminal differentiation program, you have specific mechanisms that activate that gene expression program. But it can be extremely important also to have specific mechanisms that prevent activation of the gene expression programs for the wrong cells. You want to make spermatocytes, not neurons or gut cells. And it's even more important there because these are cryptic promoters, not normal promoters for these uh, uh, heterologous genes that are firing. It's chaos in the genome. So there's lots of uh, transcripts that encode truncated proteins and the wrong things. And of course, when chaos happens in the genome, you might get uh, oncogenic proteins being expressed and that could contribute to cancer. So I think some of these surveillance mechanisms to pre prevent abnormal activation may be important uh, defenses against cancer. So that brings me to the last uh, story I want to talk about, uh, which is, so we talked about uh, uh, possible kind of developmental tumor suppressor mechanism that prevents aberrant gene expression. What about uh, possible tumor developmental tumor suppressor mechanisms that stop proliferation and turn on differentiation? So I mentioned that the gene bag of marbles is required for spermatogonia to uh, stop proliferation and become spermatocytes. So it's work in Dennis McCarran's lab, Page, Chen et al. They identified bag of marbles, benign gonial cell neoplasm, and test, tumorous testis. These proteins act together in a complex, and each one of them, they are each required for spermatogonia to stop proliferating and become spermatocytes. Megan Insko, when she was a graduate student, she was an MD, PhD student in my lab, quite interested in cancer mechanisms, and she was the one who started the work in my lab thinking about how you do the switch from proliferation to differentiation. And what she found is that the transit amplifying cells don't count the number of divisions. They do as many mitotic divisions as they can squeeze in, in the time it takes the protein BAM to reach a critical threshold. And normally BAM reaches that critical threshold, we think around the eight cell stage, so that after the next mitosis, the cells go immediately into pre-meiotic S phase and to G2 of meiotic prophase and initiate their differentiation program. Here is the expression of BAM. It turns on at the four cell stage and increases. These uh, cells here are in a uh, pre-meiotic S phase and then the protein is abruptly degraded. Uh, Megan and uh, Lexi Bailey and uh, Gonzalo and Chuck, who was an undergrad at the time in my lab, identified one of the targets of BAM and, sh and showed that uh, BAM and BGCN bind to the three prime UTR of that target and, tra and translationally repress it. And Lexi Bailey has gone on to clone the mouse homologue of one of the partners, BGCN, and show that that mouse homologue, although spermatogonia becomes spermatocytes, they fail to turn off uh, uh, certain mitotic cyclins and they go through a premature chromatin condensation that's like a mitotic attempt at a mitotic division instead of a meiotic division, the homologs aren't paired, and then they die. So it's really important to uh, get rid of the previous program. And then I just wanted to cite this paper from 2018 by Zgromo et al, uh, which did a crystal structure of a little piece of BAM and showed that it sits very nicely in a groove of on a protein called CAF40, which is a subunit of the CCR4 knot complex. This is a major complex that is recruited to specific RNAs by different mechanisms and plays a role in degrading RNAs and also translationally inhibiting. So the point is when you're gonna switch from proliferation to differentiation, to do a clean switch that mechanisms that either do translational repression of the previous program or degrade the messages of the previous program may be really important for a clean exit of the proliferation program and entry into the proper differentiation program. Okay, so that got us thinking about RNA control. So I've told you about new cell types coming with new transcription and transcriptional inhibitors, et cetera. But there's a lot more to gene expression than just turning on RNA polymerase at a particular locus. 
there's a lot that happens to the nascent transcripts. As I will tell you, there are uh, different choices in where to make the three prime end cut that terminates a message that gives rise to different length three prime UTRs. And there's of course, alternative splicing. And any of these can affect whether proteins are expressed and what proteins are expressed. So I wanna end by telling you uh, two nascent stories. Uh, Cameron and Gonzalo set out to map precisely where the three prime end cuts are made in, to terminate nascent transcripts in genes expressed in spermatogonia, but this, where the same genes are also expressed in spermatocytes. So what they did is they did a special uh, three prime end seq focused on uh, the, the small fragments that have a poly -A tail, and then they only map those RNA reads where the read matches the genome and then suddenly has a string of A's that doesn't match the genome. So they can very precisely identify where the three prime end cut that terminates the message is made. And what they found is about 500 genes that are expressed in spermatogony and in spermatocytes where the message expressed in spermatogonia has a long three prime UTR and the message expressed in spermatocytes has a much shorter three prime UTR because it made its three prime end cut at a more upstream spot. So you, here at 24 hours, you still have spermatic, you have germ cells still in S phase, but by 48 hours, you have early spermatocytes. So you can see the new three prime end cut. Uh, and uh, I, I wanna also say Lorenzo, current postdoc in the lab is working with the team to um, understand the next thing I'm gonna tell you, which is that this three prime UTR shortening. So in spermatogonia, a long three prime UTR, this is a gene called DCO, makes a kinase. Uh, and this is the form of the message that's expressed in spermatocytes, has just a tiny short three prime UTR. And here is expression of the DCO protein. So red marks chromatin, that's a, a histone to AV RFP. So here's the spermatic sites and early round spermatids. And up here at the tip of the testis, are the spermatogonia. And here you can see the DCO GFP only expressed in the spermatogonia and abruptly shut off, even though the message is still expressed in as soon as you get early spermatocytes. So that's a case where the three prime end shortening, the protein expression goes from on in the precursor cells to off in the spermatocytes. Here's another example, Lola F, here's an antibody stain. So here's the tip of a testis. Uh, Vasa in red, Lola F in green, and you can see Lola F, pro, even though the message is expressed and has a long three prime UTR in spermatogonia, it's, the protein is not expressed. And only after the cells have become spermatocytes and they are now cutting the three prime end, very short, very short three prime UTR using this upstream site, only then does the protein get expressed. So in that case, you go from long three prime UTR to short, you go from protein off, to protein on. So one molecular event, one biochemical event, where you choose to make the three prime end cut on nascent RNA can either turn protein expression on or off in a cell type specific way, presumably depending on what sequences are in this three prime UTR extension. And Lorenzo is working on that question. Uh, Cameron went on to do uh, polysome fractionation and, and analysis of the three prime ends. And he showed that for at least 250 of the 500 genes that have this three prime UTR shortening, the long versus the short three prime UTR isoforms behave differently on polysomes, suggesting that there's a widespread change in translation. Thanks. Yes. We're close to 150 and we need to leave some time for questions. So okay, I'm uh, just to wrap up. up. Okay, I am wrapping up. So in addition to the three prime end cuts, we have found that there's extensive changes in, met, in transcript by alternative splicing, partly due to the new promoters that fire in spermatocytes, partly due to three prime end cuts that take place within introns and partly due to internal splicing. And uh, Eric, Noza, and Cameron have identified 485 genes that switch the predicted protein isoform 
in spermatogon expressed in spermatogony versus spermatocytes. So there's a tremendous uh, by alternative three prime by alternative RNA processing. There's a huge change in both the kinds of proteins expressed and whether or not certain proteins are expressed in the precursor cells versus the spermatocytes. So I just want to say that when we're looking at the switch from proliferation to differentiation, we found that translational control and transcript stability play a role in triggering the switch. Alternative splicing and alternative three prime end cut uh, of the nascent RNA uh, cause a major switch in the proteins that are expressed. And then of course, then downstream, you have cell type specific uh, transcription. And how these different molecular events link up in a pathway is what I really wanna understand in the next few years. So I wanna end by saying that, uh, you know, this is, this is my lab group through the past several years. At the bottom is the current lab group. Here we are channeling our favorite organ, the Drosophila testis. Um, and we've been funded by uh, NIGMS, uh, NICHD, graduate fellowships, postdoctoral fellowships. I thank them all. But mostly, I thank you, the people in, who've worked in my lab. It's been a tremendous privilege. Um, and I owe you this award. Thank you very much. Thank you. I suggest that either you post questions on chat or raise your hand and make a comment, ask a question. Okay, uh, so go ahead and raise hands because I don't see anything in the chat yet. Sarah raised her hands. Go ahead, Sarah, but you need to unmute. Oh, Sarah disappeared, doesn't want to unmute. I, th I think she was stretching. Oh, she was stretching. <laughs> Anybody? I don't see any questions in chat. And I don't see anybody raising their hands. I can't see everybody, so. Yeah, I can't see everybody, but when they raise their hands, usually they pop up. Oh, there's, there's two, Ch Tyler and Charles. All right, Tyler, go for it. Thank you, man. Hi, Minx, that was great. Um, Thank you. So I have a question about the, how the promoters go from closed to open at that spermatogonia to spermatocyte switch. Um, I mean, so based on, on that, I would assume there's probably some sort of epigenetic modification switch at that, that transition, right? And I know you guys have done, I think Sin did some work with Polycomb in like the early 2000s, right? Yes. So we need to go back and, uh, and um, do that again, those kind of chip experiments again with more modern techniques, et cetera, especially ChipSeq. Um, but uh, her work suggested that polycomb might be acting to keep the promoters closed in the spermatogonia. And, and she, in her own lab, published a paper that uh, doing uh, epigenetic mark analysis on the precursor cells uh, in BAM mutant testis. Uh, one of the things, uh, so we've begun looking at other epigenetic marks, and a lot of the highly expressed genes that are highly expressed in spermatocytes, we don't find some of the classic marks like H3, K4, trimethyl, but it may be, I mean, they tend to be way, way open. The very highly expressed genes may not have nucleosomes. So we need to go back and compare marks with actual presence of nucleosomes to address that question. So how do they open? So there are no uh, recognized ATPases in the, the um, TMAC complex. So one possibility is that TMAC binds at, like as a pioneer factor and that it recruits uh, one of the chromatin remodeling complexes to open up the nucleosomes. So you have this 220 bases and then a phase plus one nucleosome. Another possibility uh, is that uh, the chromatin is opening and breathing and changing at that onset of spermatocyte uh, program and the testis the TMAC complex goes in and sits at the open chromatin and holds it open. So these are important questions we 
would like to answer. Yeah, so do you think like there could be something just following, like immediately following the S phase? Because they have to unwind off of those histones it, at that it point. It could, right? and, and the chromatin looks really different in a spermatocyte than in a somatic cell. There's not some somatic pairing is not there. Uh, it's just, it's just, it's a big different landscape. And this is something we very much would like to be looking at. Charles. Thank you, Thank you Minx, for this really spectacular talk and work. I, I felt um, at last for, for those of us who have taught developmental biology as you and I have after never having a course, it's a, a last a, a primer that we can recommend to our other young faculty. It's really gorgeous. Thank you. I had a question and then a, a couple of questions really. Do you, um, are there, is there information that tells us whether in this critical transition, for example, from RNA processing, nascent, of nascent RNA, that at a single locus in a single cell that the, there's ambiguity, it's this trans, trans, uh, trans um, transfer from a long to a short, is that completely abrupt or is there some wiggle worm that a cell or a locus has? That's an exact question that we, we are trying to address. And uh, uh, Cameron and Nuoza and Eric have uh, been doing long read uh, RNA-seq so that we can say, you know, which promoter is connecting, uh, you know, the promoter's firing the spermatocytes connecting up to the short three prime UTR or the promoter spermatic and uh, firing a spermatogony connecting up. For the one locus where we've looked at it, it looks like uh, you could have either promoter still cut short. So it may be a cell type specific thing, not a promoter based thing, but we really have to look at many more examples. Mm -hmm. What we have done for the three prime in cut is uh, Cameron made a reporter construct that had a completely heterologous, you know, UAS heat shock promoter driving GFP and just the three prime, the genomic region that would make the three prime UTR plus some. And that uh, if you drive expression in spermatogonia, it, it does the long cut, but if you change one nucleotide mm -hmm. at the site that for the proximal cut to make it a stronger site, then it'll cut there. So at mm -hmm. least for that gene, the business end is, is within the three prime UTR region. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. And, and I, thank you. Um, and I have a, maybe a more a field question. The, the mutation that Dan Lindsley and uh, collected in Rome. Yes, um, classic. VO45. It, it raises the question of, of inbred versus outbred genetics. Of course, in, in human genetics, it seems mostly outbred that we can deal with in population studies. Um, what's your prediction about whether these uh, that's going to be useful in, in, in so, developmental? So the the, the mutant was collected in the Via Stensia fruit market in Rome by Dan Lindsley in the Rome screen. And the Rome screen idea was you, he thought maybe the outbred population would have existing mutations. You bring them into the lab and homozygosum and then you mm -hmm. find new mutations. Yeah. But what he was doing, mm -hmm. we didn't know. I mean, it turns out he was uh, releasing transposable elements by, uh, by bringing yeah. the wild strains in and crossing them. Because mm -hmm. when we cloned, when Helen cloned always early, the first allele, it had uh, clear marks of having been affected by, uh, by transposable element. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. uh, uh, other mutation, other alleles we got from EMS and things like that, and they look like nice clean alleles. But I, mm -hmm. I do think that that, I don't wanna draw any conclusions about the wild population because I think he unleashed hybrid dysgenesis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good, thank you. And thanks again for this talk. Really Thank gorgeous. you. All right. I think we have time for one more question. If not. Thank you, Minx. Great. Thank you. Time. And I see lots and lots of former lab mates and trainees and colleagues and friends on this call. Uh, thank you for coming and thank you for all your work. And just, it's been uh really wonderful <laughs> thank you for an excellent seminar thank you thank you